Hi, I'm Brian Tima, one of the pastors here at Grace Spring Bible Church. Our prayer is that God use this as an incredible resource to align your heart with His. We know that you're not always able to plug into a local church, but we highly encourage that. Yet we are grateful to be able to offer this resource to you. And if you find that you've been ministered greatly by something that the Ministry of Grace Spring has been doing, feel free to check out our website in ways that you might be able to serve or give. Now let's prepare to hear the Word of God proclaimed. Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Rob. I'm one of the worship leaders here at Grace Spring Bible Church. Um, thanks for being here this morning or uh, watching online. Um, I'd love to invite you to stand and uh, I'm going to read from Psalm 66 before we jump in. Shout for joy to God, all the earth. Sing the glory of his name. Give to him glorious praise. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. So great is your power that your enemies come cringing to you. All the earth worships you and sings praises to you. They sing praises to your name. Would you sing with us this morning? You are for me, 
Praise. 
this house this morning. Amen. All right, you can go ahead and have a seat. Welcome to Grace Spring Bible Church. My name is Kenneth Price, and you know me. <laughs> I'm one of the pastors here. So good to see you this morning. Uh, man, what a beautiful summer we're having, yeah? We are uh, this morning continuing our summer of intentionality, and uh, I wanted to let you know about just kind of a few of the exciting opportunities that we have coming up at Grace Spring. First and foremost, if you are a student or a leader and you are going to Kansas City next week, we would love to invite you to start making your way up here. We want to pray over you this morning uh, as you get ready to head out. So yeah, make your way on up. You guys can kind of make a, you can surround me uh, up here. It'll be great. All right, so as they're making their way up, I want to tell you about a few opportunities that, that we have. So first and foremost, our new growth guide is out. It's hot off the presses. It's beautiful. Look at, look at this beautiful floral pattern. I'll do my best Vanna White. <laughs> All right, it's gorgeous. I want to encourage you to pick this up. It's not just pretty, but there's a ton of resources in this guide that will help you uh, throughout your week to, to better internalize, to better um, externalize the different things that are... <laughs> Hi, how's it going? <laughs> oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> So I uh, want to encourage you to take a look at this. <laughs> it's funny because I used to be the youth pastor, and I, it's good. Uh, so there's a lot of cool resources in there. We want to encourage you to, to pick it up. It's at the Hub. Uh, it's totally free for you. Uh, one of the things that we love here at Grace Spring is the, that we want to be a church that resources our body. And so we make these available for free. Um, our team has put a lot of hard work and energy into this, and so I hope it's an encouragement to you as you grow closer to Jesus. Second opportunity we have coming up is this week, today, starts off uh, Catalyst Week for Jesus Loves Kalamazoo. Now, you might know or you might not that uh, Grace Spring, we have been deeply involved in Jesus Loves Kalamazoo for a number of years. Actually, like some of these guys that are standing up here um, went to Impact Kalamazoo. Um, yeah, and we, we had uh, like five years, I think we went and uh, spent the week there and went to the grill sites and did all the Jesus Loves Kalamazoo awesomeness. And so this year as a church, we have uh, opportunities to serve throughout the coming week. There's, yay, <laughs> well, welcome, <laughs> we're glad you're here. Man, <laughs> can't catch a break with these guys. Um, so today is uh, one worship um, at Arcadia downtown. It's a, a chance for a bunch of churches in the area to get together and worship together and pray for what's coming up with uh, Catalyst Week. And then uh, this week, uh, you'll notice July 14th, uh, there's a prayer and grill night at, in the east side neighborhood. Um, it's uh, at East Main and Fairbanks, which is really cool. It's actually my neighborhood where I live. And so um, come and evangelize to me and bring me a, a burger. I'm kidding. Um, it, <laughs> it'll be great. It, so that's uh, I, uh, the 14th. It's going to be a great time. We want to encourage you to be involved. That's our, our partner site for this year as a church. Uh, if you want more information about that, you can check out our website, gracespringchurch.org. All the information is there. Um, also, if you have any questions, uh, our outreach coordinator, Anita Olala, will be out in the concourse bustling around. You'll see her in her bright red Jesus Loves Kalamazoo t-shirt. I encourage you to ask any questions. And also, like I'll say, um, this is like, 
it's just a really cool opportunity to, to take what we've been, been practicing and learning and put it into place. You don't have to be like this evangelical rock star. Like you can literally just have a conversation with somebody and pray with them and, and give them a free burger or a hot dog and let them know that Jesus loves them. And so uh, if, if you're free on the 14th, we would love to see you there uh, to, to partner and, and be available. I think you can sign up online. Um, so check that out. Um, the next thing I'd love to do is this is a, a awesome, robust team. We're excited that you guys are going to Kansas City. Um, they are partnering with Leader Treks, who uh, the youth have partnered with for a number of years now. And what I love about Leader Treks, I'm just going to kind of throw this out here, is that this is not the kind of organization where you just go and paint the same fence every year. Um, we're, we're actually doing a lot of good in helping in these communities. Leader Treks has deep partnerships in the communities that they're going into, and they meet and assess with um, the, the community partners and say, like, what would do the most good? How can we come in and help without hurting? And, and what do you need us to do? And so that's what I love about this organization is an opportunity to, to meet real needs, to be Jesus uh, to the community. And it also like really helps these guys to grow and to learn more about Jesus. I don't know if you know this, but uh, a lot of these trips are, are student led. And so even as the leaders going, uh, they kind of back off a little bit. Like these adults, that's hard, right, Mike? Like it was really hard. Yeah. And so it's like, what? <laughs> Oh, yeah. And so, like, even, like, you know, I, I, watched a, I watched a student build a fence not level for three hours one time because they told me I couldn't stop them. And then they realized it wasn't level, and they had to tear the whole thing apart and start over again. But it's because we learn from, from the times that we fail. And so um, it, it's just an awesome opportunity. You guys are not going to do that, right? You're going to build the fence level and flush and all the good stuff. Okay. Oh, don't even know how to build a fence. You're going to learn. <laughs> All right, so what I'd love is uh, the congregation, could you reach out your hands and pray? They are leaving July 17th, so next weekend. Um, let's be praying over them throughout this week as they prepare, but also as they go. And let's pray that, that, the, uh, that they do just incredible work for the kingdom. So Heavenly Father. I thank you for this team of students and leaders that are, are going to Kansas City uh, to make your name famous there. Lord, I thank you for partnering with an organization like Leader Treks that trains them well, that, that teaches them how to, to share the gospel. I thank you for this youth ministry that, that has been so intentional into pouring into them and teaching them uh, what the gospel is, how it impacts their hearts, and uh, how they're supposed to respond in the world around them. So, Lord, I pray for the residents of Kansas City that they will be um, spending time with. I pray that there will be salvation, but not just salvation, but, but deep change that is enacted through these ministry partners as well. They're not just coming in and, and making converts, but they are going in, introducing people to you, and then putting them in the hands of people who can disciple them well. So, Lord, we thank you for this opportunity. I pray for safety. I pray for fun. I pray for so much laughter and so much joy in you. And, Lord, above all else, that the, these awesome teenagers and adults would just shake the kingdom for you, Heavenly Father, in Kansas City. Lord, we love you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, you guys can have a seat. Thanks for coming up here. It's awesome to have you. So one more item I'd like to just share. Um, some of you joke with me lovingly, I'm sure, when Brian's here, that's like, oh, you must be preaching today. You got a haircut. <laughs> well, this is my not preaching haircut. I got a haircut to commemorate this moment because I preached four times and I can't afford that many haircuts, people. <laughs> so it, it was time. But um, the exciting news is that we have a dear friend and brother here who's going to be sharing God's word with us this morning. If it's anything like first service, like, man, I don't know if you guys were sleeping in or what, but like, whew, that first service, like, it, it challenged me like crazy. So what's cool is um, we actually met Nate um, several years ago at Impact Kalamazoo. And so he, uh, he would come in each year and share with, with the students who were there. Um, and I, I can just remember there have been scarcely been times that I felt so convicted and inspired than listening to this man share the gospel and teach. Um, he's one of my favorite people to listen to. I don't know, I didn't even tell him this, but sometimes I sneak onto the Center Point website and just listen to you preach. I kind of have a little man crush. So, um, so here's the deal. Um, we want to introduce to you Nate Bull. He's going to, um, yeah, he's going to challenge and inspire you this morning. So come on up, man. Good morning. How's it going? 
You guys are daring at 11 o'clock. I realized when I was sitting over there that at 9 o'clock, you can be sure to be done by a certain time. <laughs> so the people who are daring is you all. This could go on for days. I have things to do. Okay, yeah, my name is Nate. I am ordained pastor in the Reformed Church in America. So I'm the lead pastor at a place called Urban Apostolic Network, and we have sites in Kalamazoo, Detroit, and Benton Harbor. And our, our denomination considers me a domestic missionary because I go to an unreached people group. I am um, assigned to help lead in Benton Harbor in Detroit. Uh, I started leading in Kalamazoo, but then we went to Benton Harbor and then to Detroit, and I'm in Benton Harbor every Monday and Wednesday, and Thursday, Friday, and some Saturdays I'm in Detroit. And I, I love it. I'm called to do it, so I, I get um, energy by being there, even though sometimes it is hard to go. I get energy when I'm actually in the field, so that's how. And then uh, also I um, am contracted with a church on the west side of Kalamazoo to do, I have to do 12 to 18 sermons a year for them. Um, it's uh, to help the lead pastor take a break. <laughs> could you imagine doing even, okay, if there's 52 weeks, could you imagine doing even 45 weeks of sermons? heavens that's unethical no sorry <laughs> sorry lord who knows uh so um but then because most of our ministry sites don't have sunday services then i preach on sundays usually somewhere and i'm very um i told this to the first service but i'm very uh, i don't that's not lost on me I, I take i take um, real careful attention to where the lord allows me to preach Uh, I'm a reformer. I don't believe in coincidence. I don't think... Do Christians believe in coincidence? I don't think you do. <laughs> so it's not a coincidence that you're here. And it's not a coincidence that I'm here. So let's just pay attention to what the Lord might have for us. What I'm, we're going to start in Ephesians chapter 3. And what I want to explain to you, because we're in the gospel... Um, and the presentation of the gospel kind of, kind of, I don't know if it's a series, but a, a mind thought. Um, I, what I really want to do is present to you um, the, the exercise that we do for our ministry houses and our house supervisors and our discipleship teams so that you can enter into it and see what the Lord might have for you wherever you're at. Because I realize that this, is, this goes wherever people are. Uh huh. You ready? Yeah. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20 and 21. Now, to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. The, you see in verse 20 where it says, immeasurably more than we could ask or imagine. That word imagine there is the Greek word noeo. And it means to perceive with your mind, to understand, have understanding, to think upon, heed, ponder, or consider, or imagine. <laughs> so, yeah, imagine. The stuff that's going on inside you where no one else can see. The imaginary part of you. And this just said that he's going to do more than what you can imagine. The things that go on and you ponder and you're considering, he's going to do more than that. Now, importantly, and this is important, I believe that imagination is a gift from God, but that it's neutral. It can be used for evil and it can be used for good. For example... You could make yourself into a bad mood right now just by thinking about something. 
she never said sorry to me. I, ooh, he never, he never brought the lawnmower back. I told him specific, you know what I'm saying? You can make, you can upset yourself just by what you're mindful of. You could also make yourself really joyful about something. Hey, I tell you right now, I have a set of memories. This is, this is, I'm, re- I have a set of memories that I think about every time we have to have a family picture. <laughs> it works, because otherwise you're sitting there and they're like, say cheese or that, and you're like. I have, a, I have a whole list of things that I think about, and I'm like, and it makes me, it gives me joy. Imagination, though, in your imagination. And what I want to talk to you then about is what I would call missional imagination. Um, I believe that, and I believe this with all my heart, and um, I have scripture to prove it, but I'm not going to talk about that today, but I believe that faith is the currency of the kingdom of God. So that really means that you got to be very careful about what you're imagining, because I also believe that the ability to believe is also neutral. It can be used for good, but it can also be used against you. That means you got to be mindful of what's going on. You got to think about what you're thinking about and, and um, asking the Lord to give you a sanctified imagination. An imagination that has been empowered and cleaned up by the Holy Spirit so that you're not thinking on, and then this could go wrong and then this could go wrong. But what if this doesn't happen and you, all of a sudden you're in a full-blown a full blown panic attack? just by what you've been thinking about? Holy Spirit, come and give me a sanctified missional imagination so that we can partner together to see your name glorified, Jesus exalted, and God the Father expanding his family. Help. All right, got it? Because we're going to come back to that. Isaiah chapter 9. There's going to be some crowd participation in a few minutes, so get ready to volunteer somehow. I understand that this is a semi-Baptist church. Is that what they said? Baptist light. Baptist light. Yes. There's not a lot of amens, though. I noticed that in first service, too. Not a lot of amens. Me and you. It's all right. Isaiah chapter 9. We're going to do verse 1 and 2. Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who are in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the future, he will honor Galilee of the nations by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. All right, so there's a prophecy by Isaiah who says, hey, the, the, the land of Galilee and Zebulun and Naphtali particularly, uh, eventually God is going to remove all this distress from you and we're, there's going to be a great light that dawns for you. Got it? Here's a land in, do- in doom and gloom and light's going to come. Got it? All right, next one, Matthew chapter 4. Now, one of the things that uh, uh, my wife and I, uh, we're both people of prayer in different ways. She'll intercede for hours, and she's just a woman of intercession. And obviously, I intercede because you're commanded to. In um, the places that I work, well, you kind of have to. But um, I really, really love to walk and talk with the Lord. And I could do that for hours. um, So there is, and I do do prayer walks, but my prayer walks are about this fast. Lord, what do you think about this? What do you think we should do with so-and-so? He's getting on my nerves. You know what I'm saying? But just a prayer walk with the Lord, because I want to know, Lord, what, uh, what do you have for me? You're the God of all the universe, and you've given us your spirit so you can speak in my heart. 
What, what should we talk about? Help me, Lord. Help me, Lord. There's a lot of my walks that start like that. Please help me. So one day I'm on my walk and I'm just walking in our neighborhood and the Holy Spirit whispers to me, what if Jesus lived right there? And I remember looking over at the house and I didn't think there was anything particularly special about it, but I was like, okay, yeah, what if he did? And the Lord didn't speak to me for the rest of the time. I was curious. I was curious. Oh, Lord, where are you at? What's the... Then a week later, a week later, we read this passage in Matthew. When Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he withdrew to Galilee. Leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum, which was by the lake in the area of Zebulun and Naphtali, to fulfill what was said through the prophet Isaiah. Land of Zebulun, land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people living in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. From that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Isn't that interesting? So it said he left where? Nazareth. And went to, went to live in Capernaum. All right, check this out. Mark 2, a few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. Yeah, okay. Okay, there is something that was in my heart since I was really little. I always thought that Jesus didn't have a place to stay because of something that he said. He said, foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to rest his head. And I really thought that that meant he didn't have a place to stay. But when I read through it back again and looked at the commentators and the commentaries, he's talking in the context of discipleship because someone comes to him and says, Master, I'll follow you wherever you go. And he turns to them and says, foxes have dens. Birds have nests, son of man has no place to rest his head. And he wasn't saying he didn't have a place to live. He was just saying, if you're going to follow me, you have to give up all your rights, even the right to have a place to lay your head. But he wasn't saying that he didn't have a house because we just read he did. We just read. So let me show you. I got it. Okay, there is a general map of the area of um, Jesus during his, and you can see Jerusalem's down in, in the south and Jer with Jericho, and if you go up through Samaria, up to the northwest, you see Nazareth right there, right below Cana, and then you see Capernaum, which is right on the Sea of Galilee. So if we're listening to the scripture, what we found out is at some point after John was put in prison, right? Because that's what we read. After John was put in prison, Jesus moved from Nazareth where he grew up and he moved to Capernaum to fulfill Isaiah 9, which says, land of Zebulun, land of Naphtali, the way of the sea, by the, the Sea of Galilee, a great light has dawned. All right? You got it in your head? Jesus packs up his belongings, whatever they are. We don't know if he rented a house. He moved in with family. We have no idea. All we know is that he was living in Nazareth, and now he's living in Capernaum to fulfill Isaiah 9. Got it in your head? Okay, because we're getting ready to use a, an imagination, a missional imagination. I see, and I don't really, I don't get with people. I, I will not agree with someone who says, well, you know, I'm a little bit older, so my imagination isn't as it used to be. That's, that's, I don't believe that at all. It might be used for different things. We want to use it sanctified by the Holy Spirit to allow him to dream through us what he could do to exalt the Son, to glorify the Father, all that, okay? All right, so. All right, so, so I'm walking through, I'm walking through my neighborhood, and the Holy Spirit says, what if Jesus lived right there? So what if he did? Then a week later, I read these two scriptures. Jesus moved 
So I went and read these two scriptures to my daughters who were like uh, 12 or 13 at the time. I read them to my daughters. I said, what if Jesus lived in our neighborhood? Wow, what if, right, what if Jesus lived in our neighborhood? That'd be crazy. Because, and, and now see now, this is where you got to allow that imagination part of you to stir up. Because at some point in history, and this is just recorded, there was a group of people in this place called Capernaum who saw some dude move into their neighborhood. They're like, huh, he looks about 30. He looks like he's got some carpentry tools with him. Wonder what he's about. But the Mark 2 scripture that we just read, a few days later, Jesus again entered Capernaum. The people heard that he had come home. They gathered in such large numbers, there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to him. So when they heard Jesus came home, they rushed the house. And actually, if you want to do it later, the rest of Mark 2, right after verse 2, the rest of Mark 2 goes into the story about how he's doing his little preaching and some people come with a paralyzed friend and they have to dig in through the roof to get to Jesus, which they do. He forgives the sins. Pharisees get mad. He said, well, guess what else I can do? Take up your mat and walk. And the dude gets up and walks and they all praise the Lord. And one of my buddies said, well, because I never realized it was Jesus' house they dug through the roof. And then one of my buddies was like, well, it's a good thing he was a carpenter. I was like, <laughs> true, true. But as I asked my daughters, can you imagine with me what it would look like if Jesus lived in our neighborhood? All of a sudden you see a moving van or whatever. And, huh. The young man's moving into the, the old Smith house. And then move in, and you meet him finally. And then you hear rumors of auntie so-and-so who, whose leg was all just deformed. And she could walk now. And you actually seen her running. You go over there. And you're, you walk into the house and it smells good. And you're like, I wonder what he's cooking. Fish. Uh, <laughs> And you, man, I want, oh. And you come into the little dining room area and you look at two people that you know have no business being in church at all, have never even thought of anything religious, have terrorized the city for the longest time. And you're looking straight at them like, how do you know Jesus? And they're like, oh, well, we were hanging out all night last night. Huh? Okay, now, so stir it up because I want you guys to participate now. What would it look like if Jesus moved into your neighborhood? What if Jesus moved in next door? Tell me, what do you think? What would happen? What would go on? Crowds. There would be crowds. Maybe not so welcomed by the neighbors. Like they trampled all my new flowers. I <laughs> Don't they know where the property line is? Stepping all over our grass. Maybe. Maybe. What else? Oh, yeah. Right. Right. If Jesus moved in our neighborhood in these days, there would be a lot of news media. Yeah. Did someone say something? Oh, yeah, newspapers? Of course, they would be writing about it. It'd be on the front page. <laughs> Lady Heel of Gout, or whatever. <laughs> feast, did someone say? Food and feast? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, enough for everybody to eat. Enough for everybody to eat. You're like, what do you mean? How, where did he get all that pizza? Be like, I don't know. He just kept on bringing it out of the oven. <laughs> It just never stopped. What's going on? That Jesus, he told me to call him Josh. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Didn't you know that's what his name is? Yeshua? Yeshua is the same name as Joshua. 
Politicians might be there. There could very well be protests. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the Jesus Facebook page shut down. No more. <laughs> There, there would be super loud music. Because can you imagine someone who has been paralyzed getting completely healed? You're not going to shut that person up for days. For days. And if there's more than one, because you know how many scriptures there are that says Jesus healed them all? There would be jumping and dancing like never before. And you'd be like, I don't care that this is a Baptist light place. Because <laughs> you, you haven't been able to dance in years. Of course you're going to jump all over the place. They might ask you kindly to exit. (laughs) Um, I remember one of my daughters saying, um, he'll walk into his house and it'll be much bigger than you ever thought from the outside. And then the whole walls of all the halls filled with photographs of people. And you ask him, who is that? He's like, oh, that's my brother. I'm like, what? And that's, oh, who's that? That's my sister so-and-so. We're like, what? There's no way you have this many brothers and sisters. <laughs> Just imagining. Just imagining. It's okay. Okay, now, so then what we'll do is we'll take and ask the people who do the ministry houses. Oh, I'm sorry. I forgot. I didn't tell you what a ministry house is. All right, so a ministry house is like um, we'll go find a house that's abandoned in the middle of a drug traffic area. Buy it, start to renovate it, and start to do our Bible studies and our discipleship classes from there. And then, so then, what we do as a team is we say to ourselves, What if Jesus lived right here? What if Jesus lived right here? So, and and bless bless the Lord. We have a housing supervisor now who is over all the houses to renovate them in Detroit. Because we have five ministry houses in Detroit, and and it takes a little bit of work to get them up and running. And um, they don't like it that I'm willing to stay in a house that's just barely standing. They, they, they get irritated with that. But like, Nate, just let us at least get a toilet in there for you. I'm like, don't worry about it. I'll, I'll ask the neighbors. <laughs> so our housing supervisor did this for me, and it blessed my heart, and we've been doing it ever since. She said, give me your vision for the ministry house in Highland Park. And I said, I want everything in the house to say, I love you. We walk in the house, and you're like, Man, I love blow pops. And there's a whole, there's a whole bag of them right there. Can I have a blow pop? Like, they're waiting for you. <laughs> <laughs> Our ministry houses, all the ministry houses, the, everybody in the neighborhood knows that if you have laundry, you can come and do it. Yep, everybody knows. And it's just because we want, because we're saying to ourselves, if Jesus lived here, what would it be like? If Jesus lived in your neighborhood, don't you think that people needed to do new laundry could go get it done? I think, in my opinion, now we have, I haven't convinced the rest of my team yet. I don't think Jesus would ever lock his doors. You could be stumbling drunk at three in the morning and you'd be like, oh, I just got to get to Jesus' house. Yeah, because he, do, what's he afraid of? Um, everybody knows in our neighborhoods that if you really need a shower, you go to the ministry house on the corner of Rockdale and Linden. You could get, if, if, the, if they're there, they'll let you take a shower. Everybody knows. If I get to Linden and Rockdale and I need something to eat, not only can I go in there, I could go in the fridge without asking to see, because if it's in there, I can have it. Whoa, and you should see people who've never been in the house before. They'll walk in with the friend, and the friend will walk right up to the refrigerator and open the fridge, and they're like, what are you doing? Oh, uh, Nate and them, they will not care, believe me. You want a Coke, too? I mean, like, yeah, (laughs) I do. 
But what we did and we continue to do is to allow a sanctified divine imagination to rest over our hearts so that we could start to see how Jesus would really act in our neighborhood if he lived there. Okay? Because, listen, now, okay, here's Galatians 2.20. <laughs> I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I'm going to say it again. Because do you know what that just said? Jesus does live in your neighborhood. All right, I'm going to read it again. I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And that just said, Jesus lives in your neighborhood. Well, okay, so now as we've been praying through this stuff and imagine, Lord, allow my imagination to be sanctified and to be useful by you. Um, one of the things that the Holy Spirit whispered to us that I want to share with you because it's true for every believer. This is what the Lord said to us. Nate, I will back with all the power of heaven any prayer that you pray that goes towards loving people. Because don't you know that it was the great love of the Father that was on display through Jesus? Yeah. I've been bleeding for 12 years. Don't you worry about today because Jesus is here. Man, my back has been aching ever since that accident 14 years ago. Don't you worry. Jesus is here. But I want you to know, and this is important, as just human beings, our imaginations have been impacted by disappointment. You prayed for so-and-so and it never happened. You're believing God to do this and it didn't work out. Abraham and Sarah had to battle through the fight of faith but if you're not careful, the disappointments that you've had will impact your imagination and you'll no longer allow the Holy Spirit to guide you into the preferred future he has for you. That's the work of the enemy. The work of the enemy is to make sure you meditate on all those things God didn't do. But that's your imagination too. And you got to realize that God is in the business of sanctifying that inner part of you so that you could believe for the impossible. And I know I've seen this happen. So there is so much weird theology that we have around this kind of stuff because we haven't allowed the Lord to really change us and transform us in that way. I know of this lady in Benton Harbor. This was a, uh, just a few weeks ago. She had come up and she was walking so carefully. And I was like, I was like, Sherry, what's going on? She's like, I um, have some lady issues. Um, they say I have to have something called a hysterectomy, but I don't trust doctors. Don't trust doctors. But in my free time, in my walking, I imagine stuff just like this. Situations just like this. And I've been thinking on what he said to us. I'll honor with all the power of heaven any prayer that you pray that goes to loving people. So I'm, I said, well, Sherry, don't you worry. Hey, let me just pray for you a minute. And she, Lord Jesus, we call healing on her right now. Thank you. Amen. Because, you know, when you're in the streets, keep the, the prayer short. <laughs> no need to go into a little homily. <laughs> They're not even sure you want them to pray for you yet. You know, so, so just keep... That's all. I, thank, thank you. She come back on, on, on Wednesday, and she walked right up, and I said, Shh, hey, it looks like you're doing better. She's like, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, actually, I haven't been in pain for a few days now. I said, did you remember to say thank you? I'll do that. 
I'll do that. Remember, when Jesus healed 10 lepers, only one came back to thank him. It's not odd. It's not odd. But this is the kind of imagination that we're doing. And, and, um, and, and this is one of my mentors said to me, and this has helped out so much when it comes to this kind of stuff. Any thought that you have that has not factored in the power of the Holy Spirit is still an incomplete thought. So I imagine these kinds of situations in my head. This, I know this sounds weird, but in my head, I see myself raising someone from the dead who has just been murdered in the streets. In my heart and mind, I'm preparing for the time that it might happen. I'm not allowing the Lord to, uh, uh, to, to, to rain. Who dreams cutting back? Well, I better not dream that. This, it's called dreaming for a reason. Well, that could never happen. Well, then you're not really dreaming and imagining. Is that, that's all, anything goes, huh? Well, I want a Corvette that's red, but it also could fly, but it also could go underwater. And then, that's imagining. Huh? And we are called because he said, I'm going to do more than you could ask or imagine. More than what you could ask or imagine. So we've got to ask the Lord to sanctify our imagination. It, it gets very, very simple. I'll tell you, this is the last story, I promise. There's this dude in Benton Harbor who is a mess. I'll just say that. He drinks a lot of alcohol. And they call him Money Mike, but Money Mike likes to fight because he's from the other side of Benton Harbor. So when he comes over to our side, it's beef. Oh, that's another word of saying there's conflict. <laughs> Sometimes I say stuff when I, I've been a street preacher since 1999. Sometimes I'll say stuff and the people are like, what does that mean? <laughs> There's conflict when he comes to the house. Let's we'll say it like that. And we do salad almost every single Monday and Wednesday because we do other foods that's not as healthy. So I feel a clear conscience that we also, along with this burgers, you could also have a salad. We do salads every Monday and Wednesday. So I'm, Money Mike comes in and he's sitting in, and he's he's been he's tipsy and he's sitting over there and he's like, you know, it might be nice to have French dressing sometime. Because <laughs> we do ranch exclusively. <laughs> ranch, ranch is like ranch is like universal almost. So it might be nice if you have French dressing sometime. So I was going to the store, and because I imagine, I tried to imagine daily, how would the Lord love someone through me today? All right, who wants to get loved down? Oh, I'm going to love somebody today. Oh, I'm going to love somebody today. Because I have all the power of heaven back in me, Amen. and so do you. Amen. You have all the power of heaven back in you. Oh, I'm, I'm going to love somebody today. So I go to Gordon Food Service to get the stuff for the thing, and guess what? I'm going down the aisle, and I see... French dressing. <laughs> Grab that French dressing. <laughs> Put it in the cart, buy it. Uh, we get to the Wednesday, we got the salad, the money Mike comes in. And I said, Money, hey, listen, man, I got French dressing for you. He said, That means you were thinking about me. I was. It was on my imagination. It was in my mind and heart. The Lord was sanctifying my heart and mind to be able to love completely. That's missional imagination. And you could do it. And the reason that I could say you could do it anywhere is because you could do it right here, right now. You could start to think, what if Jesus lived in my house for real? What if he lived, what if he lived in my house? What, if, what would that mean? Because right now, this is, this is just being honest. Right now, when people see our cars outside the front door, they, they will, sometimes they do run there because they need a ride to here and there. Or they're like, can you pray for my... This one, one of our neighbors came specifically out of her house with a great deal of effort because she wanted us to pray for her daughter. Her daughter was really, really sick. Couldn't even go to work. And she said, I came down here as soon as I saw your cars. I need prayer. And her daughter was healed before the end of the day. But that's the kind of thing that it should happen because the fact of the matter is Jesus does live in your neighborhood. 
But you've got to use the imagination God has given you. Allow the Holy Spirit to sanctify it so you can have a missional imagination that impacts your whole neighborhood. And I would suggest as you go out to Jesus Loves Kalamazoo, just ask God before you go out, hey, God, give me your imagination. So let's see what you would like to do if Jesus was really with me. Hey, I noticed you limping a little bit there. Was it? Do you mind if I pray for you a minute? I guess. Just do it. We have prayed for hundreds of people who haven't gotten healed. But we don't allow that to impact our imagination. And that's what I'm asking of you now. In this season of our nation where the darkness seems like it's getting darker, guess what? Just like in Zebulun and Naphtali, a great light has dawned. Over in Richland, a great light has dawned. A great light has dawned. Obviously, in Capernaum, they were shocked. They were shocked. And I don't, I don't know of a better time than in great turmoil for his light to shine. Whew. So, Heavenly Father, I pray over the things that we're thinking about the imaginations of our heart, the way we allow you to start guiding our inmost thoughts. Any thought that is exalted against who you are, we cast it down and we take captive every thought. We rely on you to give us in our hearts what we're supposed to be thinking about. We reject any thought that has to do with bitterness or envy or strife or division. All that we rejected in Jesus' name. Any thought of unforgiveness, jealousy, all that, that's out of our imagination. Thoughts of kindness and gentleness and love. Those we allow, Holy Spirit, come and guide us in that fullness over generosity. We, <laughs> generosity beyond reason. We receive that kind of thought. Hallelujah. Ah, we receive worshiping the Lord in our front lawns, completely unhindered and giving praise to the Almighty and letting that atmosphere rush through our neighborhoods. We receive that kind of imagination. We receive imagination of giving blessings to people as they leave. Bless you. May the Lord bless you and keep you and may his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. We receive thoughts and imaginations of reconciliation with people from whom we've been estranged. Come, Holy Spirit, and birth imagination of reconciliation in our hearts. Imagination of a purpose. Imagination in walking in the fullness of our calling. We receive that kind of imagination. Imagination of hope for our future and not for harm. We reject all imaginations that bring anxiety. All worry and doubt and fear, we reject those. And as soon as they come into our hearts, we confess it, we release it, and we meditate on your word. Ooh, we imagine your soon coming. Oh, thank you, Lord. We imagine the coming of Jesus. Oh, how excited he's going to be able to see us face to face. Lord, we imagine that first meeting with you and looking into your eyes and seeing nothing but overwhelming love. Hallelujah. We imagine people seeing that love in us towards them. Hallelujah. So, Father, we just receive it today, a missional imagination. Uh, we receive being able to see in our hearts the things of the kingdom and be able to walk in them in fullness. Sanctify our imagination and give us your heart in every area in Jesus' name.
So I don't know how many of you come to both services on a Sunday morning, but uh, Nate, I want to thank you that we got a different sermon from first service to second service. Um, I'd encourage you all to go back and, and uh, watch first service as well. Um, it's just, it's beautiful to think about how the Lord put who he needed to hear this message here right now. Um, my wife and I were, were walking yesterday talking about the church as a, an organization in the building and the idea of doors being locked and uh, what the world would look like if people were just allowed into the church and allowed into our homes and allowed into our businesses. Um, and so I love the, the in your obedience, um, we got a little two for one deal. At least the worship team got two sermons. So uh, you, we've said from the get go, you can never get too much church. So maybe you come to the nine and the 11 next time. But uh, yeah, we, we wanna give, y'all about 10 or 15 minutes to just kind of process what the Lord has, has spoken today. Maybe it's an opportunity for you to, to maybe turn back on your imagination. I think we get so busy in the, the doing of life, sometimes we forget to just walk with Jesus. So uh, we're going to sing a couple songs. We'd encourage you to get up and move a bit. Um, you're welcome to sit, you're welcome to stand, but uh, let's just see what the Lord does in the next uh, little bit.
just a mess. Sorry. <laughs> wow. Um, I'd love to invite Nate back up. I'd love to pray a prayer of blessing over him and the ministry that he's doing. Um, thank you for the gift of your time. And um, man, just thanks for sharing your wisdom and, and your passion. Um, you inspired me today. I know I'm going to walk away with a lot to think about. So um, would you guys just extend your hands? Heavenly Father, I thank you for Nate. Um, Lord, I thank you for this gift of conviction, this gift of inspiration to walk with sanctified imaginations. Lord, I pray that each and every one of us would believe that Jesus does live in our neighborhood and it's in our house. That we would believe that Jesus goes to work where we work and it's in our cubicles. Lord, I do pray for imagination of, of restoration with families and restoration with um, estrangement. And, and Heavenly Father, that we would come to see our neighborhood be healed and to know you, and that it would start with us. Lord, I pray for Nate and the work that he's doing in, in these ministry houses and in Benton Harbor and Detroit and in Kalamazoo and Lord, the ways that... that He's just stepping out in faith. Lord, I pray that this ministry would be blessed, that it would be highly favored by the people that call it home. Lord, not, not for anything that Nate's doing, but because he's laid his life in your hands, a living sacrifice to see others come to know you. Lord, I know his heart, and that is to get Nate out of the way and, and to be a vessel for you. And I just pray that you would bless the humility that he brings to the table, coming to, to see people know you and to advance the kingdom of God wherever he steps. So Heavenly Father, I pray, Lord, that, that he would see people come to know you, that, that he would see people healed through his work, that he would see people um, embrace what it means to live a life full of you 
And that would be the work of his hands, that he would leave a legacy on this earth that, that is not Nate Bull, but it's what Jesus Christ did through Nate Bull as he envisioned your Holy Spirit impacting the towns and the cities that he's working in, Lord. I pray if, if there are situations that he's like, man, I don't know how you're going to work this out, Lord. Even things that he's thinking about right now, Lord, I just pray that he would walk back into these places even tomorrow. And that, that, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would grip these situations, that there would be healing, that there would be restoration. Lord, I just pray that for, for great revival in Detroit and Benton Harbor through the work that you are doing through this organization and through Nate's life. Lord, we pray a blessing over this man of God as he is your hands and feet in these communities. Lord, I just pray that, that you would impact the world around him because of his obedience. Lord, we thank you for his time with us and the inspiration that that has been. And thank you for your Holy Spirit working through him to breathe life into our hearts. Lord, we love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. All right, church, so I'm going to lay it out there. <laughs> you don't have a reason not to step out in this, period. There's no reason. Jesus commanded his disciples to go out into the world and make disciples, to baptize them and to teach them. And so my prayer for you as we leave this place is that your gospel imagination would soar. That, that those things that seem too big won't be too big. Man, even like go home and, and invite your neighbors over for a grill out tonight. It's a perfect night to do it. I would just encourage you, dream big. The Holy Spirit's got your back. Um, as we leave here, continue to uh, be faithful in your giving. I know you will because you're a church that, that loves to see the work of Jesus out in the world around us. If you need prayer this morning, our prayer team is available. Um, man, we love you. We love you. We love you. We hope you have a fantastic week. We'll see you soon.